Yes, I'm, I'm going to continue on the theme of, of transatlantic slavery. But really, my, what my talk is, is about is how we can use DNA um, to, to, to write history, essentially. Uh, and, and of course, the two talks after me will continue on that, on that, on that topic. Talking using modern DNA, but also using ancient DNA. I'm going to talk about it in the context of the transatlantic slave trade. A lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about uh, is really not so much part of this project that, that we're here for, this the Citigen project, but was part of a of an earlier earlier project um, called Duratas, uh, which was a Marie Curie uh, training network. Um, so a, a PhD training network um, that ran from 2011 to about 2015, and we had 10 partner institutions across Europe. Um, and it, it produced 13 PhDs over the course of these, of these four years, and all of them um, working on the theme of the transatlantic slave trade uh, and its, its, its contemporary legacies. But it was a very interdisciplinary project, so there were people, uh, historians on board, um, archaeologists, uh, and, and people working in, in, in population genetics. And we, we, uh, this is, the website is still live, although it's not being updated very regularly uh, these days anymore, but if you're interested, you can, you can, you can go and, and, and check it out. Um, we worked around three major themes, and one of these themes is what I want to focus on for the rest of, of my talk uh, today, which is origins and ancestral ties, and I guess that's, you know, that's what more or less brings you all together into this, into this room today anyway. Um, and of course, in the context of the, of the slave trade, um, this is, a, this is a topic that has interested historians for, for decades. Um, and, and a lot of, a lot of um, interesting work has, has been done. So for instance, what you, what you have here, you might be familiar with, with, um, with images like it. This is from uh, a database called the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, which is really the culmination of um, several decades of, of, of uh, documentary archival research. And this is available online, um, and it contains uh, records of over 35,000 slaving voyages that crossed the Atlantic between about 1500 and, and 1880. And uh, the point here is, though, that it gives us a lot of information about the general volume of the trade. Um, so how many people were enslaved, over 12 million uh, during the course of, of the slave trade. It also gives us indications about their destinations, so where they were disembarked in the New World, in the Americas. So one, one thing that people often often ignore is that to, to North America, only about 500,000 slaves were imported into North America. Ah, thanks very much. Whereas, you know, the, 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 the uh, great majority of, of, of uh, enslaved Africans actually went to, to, to South America. Now, when it comes to origins, though, um, there are certain limitations with, with the kind of data that we have available. So out of these 35,000 records, only about a third make any mention of, of origins at all. Um, and when they mention origins, they tend to mention coastal shipping points as opposed to the people's actual ethnic or geographic origins. And so this is why you've got you know, these, these arrows starting here on the West African coast. This is a this is a, a, a more precise image telling you you know giving you the same thing with uh, numbers of of, uh, of Africans <coughs> being being transported over to the to the Americas. Now, this limitation of, 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 of this type of data you know has been known to historians for a while, and, and here a Dutch historian in uh, already in the 70s simply concluded that. This problem is, is too complex to be solved by, by, by the current resources and, and, and data that, that we have available. Another aspect um, of this is, is genealogical research. Um, and here, especially in the context of African American family history, um, there is the, the fact that um, people interested in in their family history, of that people of African descent in the Americas, African Americans also hit this 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 wall of, of, of slavery, as as it's called. So the fact that before the 1870 census, um, 
there are essentially no records of enslaved people in, in, in the US in this case, um, and in, in, in the Americas, I guess, more generally. In addition to this, the problem of, of uh, trying to uh, use historical records like those included in the Pennsylvania Slave Trade Database to maybe make a connection back to Africa is, is you know, an extremely complex problem. This is another aspect to this that you might be familiar with, and naming practices have been mentioned already a, a number of times, but something that complicates this search for roots or origins in the context of uh, African-American family history is the fact that after the abolition of slavery, um, slave people tend to take on the names of their owners, making it very difficult to trace the paper trails back, back, back further than, than that. Um, and I just put this link in here because just to say that there are uh, things happening also in, in, in this regard that, um, on, on, you know, with regards to paper trail, but try to address these issues and uh, to make databases freely available that people can use in order to, to, to try and trace their genealogies, particularly here in the case of African Americans. So there's, the, for instance, the Friedman Bureau project, um, which includes over, I think, five million records of um, enslaved Africans who were reported after emancipation. And this, this, this type of data is freely available and people can start to use it in order to trace their, their family history. Um, but it will only go so far. So the other um, tool that has been publicized a lot through um, popular TV series like uh, you know, Finding Your Roots and uh, Henry Louis Gates, you might have come across him, uh, who has a show on PBS in the American in, in the US, very much kind of advertising DNA as, as, as a way for African Americans in particular to, to try and um, go beyond the paper trail, go beyond the, the, the wall of slavery and try to reconstruct their family history using, using DNA. Um, and here, uh, you know, I just a couple of slides uh, to, to illustrate the point that yes, it is, it is very much true that especially in the last Ten years or so, we've, we've uh, you know, undergone a revolution in, in terms of the way we generate uh, genetic data. Um, people talk about the sequencing revolution. Uh, we're able to sequence an entire human genome in about an hour or something like that. It is, uh, and that that has led to uh, large-scale studies uh, trying to match human genetic diversity as well. This is just a slide showing you, you know, the, 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 with this invention of, of uh, new forms of sequencing, the cost of sequencing has also been reduced, and of course that allows us to, to, to sequence more samples from different populations um, and to, to use it uh, for, 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 uh, for various things. Now, this is a, this is a very famous um, plot by now that probably all of you have seen. It's by uh, John Volver and his colleagues, who uh, use this kind of data, uh, so genome-wide uh, SNP data, um, from, in this case, about a thousand individuals from across Europe. And what they showed, and you know, was quite a revelation at the time, but um, that you have this uh, genetic structure in human populations, and the simple fact here is that it's that it tends to mirror geography. So you can you have here. Uh, the genetic map of Europe uh, with different uh, European populations clustering, forming clusters, and they tend to mirror a, 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 a geographic map of Europe. So there's a close correspondence between genetic and geographic distances. And of course, we can use this in, in, in access tree research or when we're interested in population histories in order to uh, trace our own ancestry. So you can sequence your own DNA and you can simply you know, try to plot yourself in that in that in that cloud of data and see where you fall. But we can use it on, on at other levels, on other levels, in order to reconstruct uh, population histories. And that's that's what I uh, want to talk to you about for the next uh, uh, half an hour or so. So, one more slide though uh, that I forgot about, very important, um, is that um, there is there is uh, when it comes to the history of African populations or. Uh, African-American or African-descended populations in the Americas is um, 
somewhat of a, of, a, of a discrepancy in terms of, or an imbalance in terms of how much data has been generated. So this is a, this is a plot from, or a graph from last year uh, in Asia where um, they looked at uh, how much, uh, how many genetic studies have been done uh, on human populations. Uh, so this is, this, this was the status in 2009. And this is 2016, and you can see that back in 2009, almost uh, you know, well, 96 percent uh, were done on people of European ancestry, and only four percent were done on people of non-European ancestry. And out of those, I think maybe half a percent or so were done on people of, of African descent. In the case, you know, in, in 2016, it looks a little better. So about 80 percent still um, genetic studies are being done on, on people of European ancestry, and about 20% of people of non-European uh, non ancestry, and of those, maybe 2% are uh, have been done on, on, on people of African ancestry. And that's despite the fact that Africa is um, uh, the place where we ultimately all originate from, the place that shows uh, the greatest genetic diversity. Um, and for that reason, that's also perhaps arguably the most interesting place to look at. Um, there are various reasons for that um, that, I, that I don't have to go into. But just to say that if we want to use genetics in order to reconstruct population histories or uh, for African Americans, for instance, to trace their own history, it is extremely important to have uh, reference data available. And um, because of how uh, the field of, you know, how human genetics has been progressing, this is not necessarily the case. And so that complicates things uh, a little bit. Having said that, um, there are various different projects um, undergoing uh, at the moment that try to rectify this situation. And here I've just um, you know, pulled, up, pulled up a few. There is the H3 Africa uh, Consortium, which is a, a big consortium of various different institutions in Africa uh, and also uh, elsewhere uh, that try to map uh, human genetic diversity in, in Africa. Um, another one is, is led by the Sanger Institute in Cambridge, the African Genome Variation Project. And then there were smaller projects like, like our own, where we tried to um, essentially fill gaps in this genetic map in order to try and uh, uh, have the data available that we needed in order to try and answer the questions that we, that we had. So, you know, bearing that in mind, I now want to give you um, just a, a, a few insights into the kind of work we have been doing both, starting first with a modern DNA perspective, and then going on to talk about, to talk about ancient DNA. So in terms of modern DNA, um, we had one project um, which was led by a PhD student, uh, Cesar Fortes Nima, um, and he looked at uh, a population, uh, modern day, present day living population from uh, French Guiana and Suriname, who were descendants of uh, Maroons, so Maroons are runaway, runaway slaves, who formed independent communities uh, in, in, in the early 1700s or in the 1700s after having essentially escaped from slavery, uh, Dutch slavery in, in that case, in, in, that part of, in that part of South America. And so what, what Cesar was, was interested in was, um, can we use modern genetics to uh, try to add to, to, to the history of this particular population. So concerning their origins, concerning, you know, uh, perhaps admixture patterns, um, and, and so on and so forth. And I'm going to just show you a, a couple of those results. The study will be um, published any day now. Um, so here, the first thing that, that, that we found was that um, this, this uh, population of uh, of, of, of descendants of, of Maroons called the Noir Maroc, they, they showed a very high level of African ancestry, much higher than other African descendant populations in the Americas. So comparing it to African Brazilians or African Colombians, for example, um, the Noir Maroc had almost 100% of African ancestry, whereas African Colombians and African Brazilians had higher levels of European and, and Native American ancestry in, in their genomes. And that simply reflects um, the, the history of relative isolation of, of the Noir Marron and basically a survival strategy, staying as far away from Europeans as possible um, 
and and that you know led to to, to this particular to this particular pattern. So then what we wanted to do was to see if we could use the the DNA that we um, uh, the sequence data that we generated from SNP data actually that we generated for these these individuals to try and see um, whether we can look at um, their origins. And this is this is uh, uh, like the other plot um, that I showed you earlier, again, a PCA plot, principal component plot, but showing you um, in, 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 in different colored uh, triangles here, um, that's the uh, genetic variation in Africa. So different populations, I'm sorry, I don't have the legend here, but here you basically have West populations from West Africa uh, and populations, yeah, populations from West Africa, populations from then going around the uh, the Bight of Benin and the Bight of Biafra, populations from West Central Africa, and then populations from Southern Africa. And although it's not particularly clear on this plot, um, the Noir are these dots here in, in, in black, and they um, tended to cluster with populations from uh, the Bight of Benin, the historical Bight of Benin, so that's, that's the area of Western Nigeria, essentially, and Gulf Coast, so that, that would be, be present-day Ghana. And in contrast to this, um, the African Brazilians, you really can't see that very clearly here, but they're in gray, and they cluster with um, populations from Angola and West Central Africa. So while we're not able to pinpoint exactly a particular population that, um, uh, that the source population, we can narrow it down considerably using, using the kind of data we have available. So, the other thing that um, we wanted to do, and this, this now goes back to kind of like A-level biology, but, um, uh, and you, you probably all, all know this, but what we wanted to do was to try and see if we could say anything about, anything else about the demographic history uh, of, these, of these populations. And to um, try and get there, well, you have to understand the ways in which we inherit our DNA, and, and, and we all know this, you get a copy from your mom and a copy from your dad. Um, if, you, if you take this and, uh, you know, consider a case where you have a local population, so uh, and then a population of migrants um, that comes in, and you have some sort of admixture event. Uh, you can use essentially the different bits of the of, of or stretches of DNA um, from from each, and you can use the length of these segments essentially in order to get some sort of estimate of. Uh, when that particular admixture event happened. So essentially like the longer time away it is in the past, the shorter the segments will be. So to illustrate this, um, you can take uh, the case of uh, European colonization of, of the New World. You have a European migrant population coming to uh, the Caribbean, Puerto Rico for instance, and you're to mix in there with, with locals, and you will uh, end up with a, an admixed population, like for the Puerto Ricans. And what, what we can do is to not only estimate uh, how much of European ancestry is present in that particular population, but we can try and estimate at what point in time in the past that. Um, ancestral component arrived, in this case, in the Caribbean. And so this is what um, we did for uh, this particular population, the, the normal um, And even though the, the, the challenging bit here was um, that there was, as we said earlier, there was only very little European and Native American ancestry present actually in their genome. So there were 98% you know, um, African. But even so, we got um, some, some, some results which suggest different pulses of uh, first Native American ancestry and then later on a pulse of European ancestry into uh, essentially African, African genomes. And interestingly, the dates on these estimates that we got um, correspond you know, quite well to, uh, with, with, with the formation of the first rural communities around in, in, in around the 1740s, 1750s. So that, that was you know, quite, quite fascinating to, to, to see. So then lastly, one of the, one, another thing that we uh, did was to look at essentially patterns of uh, sex bias gene flow in these, in these genomes. 
And this, um, you know, also we discussed it in the case in, in the, with the history of Hans Jonathan. He had a European father and, and an African mother. Well, here we see this on a population level uh, 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 once again. So, in in every case of African uh, descending populations in the Americas, we see a, a, a dominant uh, African female gene flow and uh, a male-dominated European gene flow. You know, reflecting basically this you know these, these patterns of admixture. Interestingly, one one uh, one result that popped up that we're not quite sure how to explain, but Apparently in African Colombians, there is uh, a stronger male uh, Native American uh, input as well, which is a bit more puzzling to explain. So those are the kind of things that um, you know you can gain from from just looking at modern DNA. But what I want to do for the for the next few minutes is to give you an insight into some of the things that uh, we have done and can do using ancient DNA. So of course the limitation with modern DNA is that it's it's um, basically a, a, a palimpsest of what you know what, what we're dealing with now. But if you want to look further back in time, and uh, Dan's and Abby's talk uh, after mine will go further into this, uh, you really need um, timestamp samples from from uh, from way back in the past. So here uh, I'll give you uh, a few examples of this. So the, the first point to make that, you know, like other uh, uh, areas of, of, of research, ancient DNA has been impacted majorly by this event of this, this new sequencing technology. So uh, this is, you know, I just put into Google Scholar, uh, you know, type in ancient DNA, and you see that after this uh, technology was introduced, you have, uh, you know, hundreds if not thousands of studies being conducted um, just because we're A, able to generate the data and B, we're able to believe in the data that we actually generate. So, uh, in, a, in a few bullet points, the, the main uh, uh, impact uh, for that is, or the reasons for that is, is the extremely high sequencing output that we have, it's much more efficient, it's less time consuming, you don't have to spend as many hours in the lab trying to generate the data using cloning or you know, PCR and stuff. Um, and you use less, much, much less sample material. And then this important point, which is the ability to assess uh, data authenticity, so we're, uh, and to estimate contamination rates. So the first study that I want to talk to you about, this is now already a couple of years old, um, but this was really the, um, one of the first studies, uh, the other one, was, was done by, by, by uh, uh, Dan and a student of his, actually, um, where we tried to use uh, genetic data in order to trace the origins of uh, enslaved Africans. And so historical, using historical samples. So this particular um, study uh, was done on um, individuals that came from the island of St. Martin. Um, that was just you know, flattened by a, by a hurricane. And St. Martin is, 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 is better known for having this crazy airport where you have planes coming in above your head. But in, um, in about 2010, um, Jay Havasser, an archaeologist who works on the island, they, during construction work, uh, discovered three, three burials on the island. And uh, two of them uh, were males, and, and one was a female, aged between 25 and 40 years of age. <laughs> Um, and judging by the artifacts, our associations like cultures and, and such that were in the burials, they estimate about a mid to late 17th century date for those for those three burials. Um, now, interestingly, um, all three of them had um, these, these clear signs of dental modification, which was um, you know, a clear sign that that, um, uh, that they were probably from from Africa, given that that was a very common practice uh, in Africa at the time. And it also was an indication that they were probably born in Africa as opposed to in the New World. So what we wanted to do was to try and see if we could use the DNA techniques that I've been, I've been describing in order to try and, and, and trace their, their origins in, in Africa. Um, before we did that, we tried to also look at historical records. 
uh, and so this is this is uh, when you look at the transatlantic slave trade database um, that I showed you earlier, you actually find uh, one record of one particular uh, slaving vessel that arrived in St. Martin um, in 1665. So it fits with with, with the date that they estimated for those for those three burials. You can even get the name of the vessel, uh, the captain's name. Um, it tells you where the voyage started, and it tells you um, also where um, slaves were purchased that were brought over to, to St. Martin. The first place was uh, in Goree, uh, in Senegal, and the second place uh, was in Amina on the, on the Gold Coast. What it doesn't tell you, though, is, is uh, where these individuals came from. And so this is then where, where the DNA comes in. This is just gives you a summary of the, the kind of data we were able to generate. It wasn't much. Um, so low coverage genomes, so that means we randomly sample bits of their genomes um, at, at, um, uh, at, at lower coverage, as we call it. Um, we estimated contamination rates, so you know, trying to establish that the data that we generated is actually uh, authentic, real deal. We got mitochondrial genomes out of them, so got the mitochondrial haplogroups that you will be familiar with, and also for one of them, uh, a white chromosome, white chromosome haplogroup. Now, and this is this is uh, you know the, the main result really. Um, again, uh, having a background of genetic variation for uh, West Africa, well, sorry, for, for 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 Africa in general, um, going from Southern Africa here in this case to uh, Central Africa. So Angola and Cameroon and these regions, West Africa, and then uh, this this further into um, the area of Chad and, and these kind of regions. And so what was interesting for for these three individuals that they um, essentially you know pop it with different with different populations. So whereas the first one was uh, showed greater affinity with populations from Cameroon, particularly the Bamoon, um, the two other individuals uh, you know plot it closer to uh, or probably with populations from uh, the uh, from Ghana and, and Nigeria. So that you know, again, like with the result for the normal all, we're not able to pinpoint exactly where these individuals come from, but we're able to distinguish between uh, different regions in Africa given the kind of data that we have available. For the one individual that we got uh, this Y chromosome haplogroup. This was uh, actually quite, quite, quite interesting, and, 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 uh, because it showed um, this particular haplogroup uh, has a very restricted distribution in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's almost at it's here in, in this part of uh, northern Cameroon, um, it's, it's it's present at very, very high uh, frequencies. So it actually fits with uh, the genome-wide data result that we got for this particular individual. So, at least for this one individual, you know, we, if I had to bet on it, I'd, you know, I would be fairly certain that this individual came, perhaps, or had ancestors from that, from that particular area. Now, the second case study that I want to show you um, is work that I'm doing together with an archaeologist working in the States called Julie Shabitsky. Um, she works on uh, 18th century plantation sites in, in Maryland. And this is a this is a community-led project, um, and it is interesting because they chose to focus not on the grand plantation house or on other aspects of the plantations, but they focused on on the slave quarters. And one of the most common finds on these plantations are are, are these type of artifacts. Does anybody know what this is? Probably. Any idea? This is about this is about an inch. So this is a uh, might not be able to get it just from that picture. It is part of a pipe, that's right. Gowland pipe. Clay pipe, that's right. It is a clay pipe, or at least part of it. And you'll be able to recognize it much better if I show you the other part of the pipe. So that, that, that will be the, you know, the top, top of the pipe. And so what Julie wanted to know is if we could extract DNA from the pipe stems uh, and, and say anything about the person who smoked the pipe. And so we did, and it turns out we can. So we, we extracted DNA from this pipe stem, uh, human DNA, and the first thing uh, that we did, we weren't able to generate a whole lot of data. 
it's coming from a pipe to them. But um, and the first thing that that um, we, we we found was that uh, the human DNA that we were able to generate um, was likely from a female. So we're dealing with a female Pisces. Now, of course, you could say, well, that could be Judy's DNA. Um, you know, she, after all, like excavated those remains. Um, but I, I'm not showing you this, but if we have ways of authenticating um, our DNA by looking at characteristic damage patterns, for example, and I can tell you that it has these characteristic damage patterns. Also, we were able to get enough DNA out of it in order to trace the ancestry of the DNA that was in the pipe stem. And so in here, in this case, you can see, although I have to tell you, it was not a lot of data. Um, so here you have, again, a background of African populations. Um, and in this case, uh, the pipe stem you know, plotted close to this population cluster, which are well, which happen to be the Mende from, from Sierra Leone. So here, you know, just to show you that one can use this type of data even from, from artifacts, and there are reasons why um, you know, we might might be. I mean, there are reasons why uh, it's not too crazy to think that you might get DNA from a pipe stem. Uh, it's made of silica. Uh, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are reasons why 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 that's not impossible. And here, you know, we've shown that you know it, it, it might well be possible, and that you know tells you uh, something about the, the individual, um, their background, and so on and so forth. Right. So the, the last one. In just, a, in just a few minutes. This is um, a project that was also done as part of this Eurotest project by uh, the student Marcella, Alessandra Valgalasco. Um, she uh, worked on uh, a, a little bit of a different context. So we're not talking here about the Americas. We're not talking about the Caribbean. So context that you want you know, traditionally associate with plantation slavery and so on. But, um, Working in a context of a small island in, in the South Atlantic called St. Helena, and you will maybe have uh, heard about it recently in the news because they got um, an airport, which was uh, termed the most useless airport in, in, in the world. Um, but during construction work, in that, oh, it was also Napoleon's second exile, so you will know that probably. What the island is not known for, though, is that during the period, in the later period of the Transatlantic slave trade, um, over 30,000 enslaved Africans or liberated Africans at that point were brought to the island. So this is at a point after uh, the abolition of the slave trade in 1907, um, and British, the British Navy was essentially rolling off the coast of West Africa and intercepting slavers that were still engaged in the trade, uh, liberating the individuals on board, but instead of repatriating them um, to where they came from in, in Africa, a lot of them were brought to, to St. Helena. Now, this is a tiny island. Um, and some of those were then repatriated in inverted commas to other parts of Africa, like Sierra Leone, um, Liberia, but others also ended up in, in Jamaica, British Guiana, and, and, and Trinidad. But um, a large number actually uh, died on the island um, because of poor sanitary conditions um, and, and, and so on and so forth. And during um, during the work that was done in preparation for the airport, um, British archaeologists um, excavated over 300 burials um, at, at at the site where now the airport where now the airport is essentially. Um, and those 300 are probably only a small fraction of the burials that are actually there. The estimates of, of you know several thousand burials being there. Um, so what what uh, Marcella did, she was able to generate about um, twenty mitochondrial genomes. Well, you know, mitochondrial genomes for about twenty individuals, um, and um, also some genome wide data that I'm going to show you in a minute. But just looking at the mitochondrial uh, data. Um, you can, we can look at the, essentially the frequency distribution of uh, the mitochondrial haplogroups groups that we have there, and we can compare it to uh, a database uh, of, of, of the same haplogroup group frequency distributions from, from West Africa. And although this is, you know, this is, this is 
is not a particularly good way of doing it. Um, but you can see that in, if you just compare these frequency distributions, you can see that there might well be a you know a greater affinity to West Central Africa than to Southern Africa, simply based on the, the distribution of those of those upper groups. A much more powerful way of doing this, though, is is again to look at look at genome-wide data rather than um, rather than just doing parental markers. So um, what we've got here then is again the, the, the principal component plot uh, where we you know try to plot these twenty individuals um, from from Saint Helena uh, on you know against the background of, of African genetic variation. And here, um, you know, the result is that they do uh, cluster all with populations from uh, West Central Africa. So these are uh, populations from Angola and Cameroon here in the north, indicating, you know, suggesting that that um, at least this sample of 20 individuals um, are more likely to have come from from that part of Africa as opposed to West Africa or, or uh, Southern Africa. So that, um, you know, with that, I, I just uh, conclude my talk. Uh, just to, to sum up, to say that DNA can, can be used to trace ancestral origins where historical and genealogical information is missing. But I think it's important to, to bear in mind that, at least as the reference data sets are at the moment, um, we're, we're not able to precisely pinpoint some populations, but only to, to narrow it down to, to regions, perhaps. And, and Again, it's important to remember that the accuracy of these results depends on um, very much the, the available uh, reference data. So I'd just like to acknowledge um, that this, this research was uh, funded through the European Union, the American Reactions, and I'd like to thank all the members of the, of the Eurotest Network. And thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Hannes. That's a fabulous presentation. Um, where, where are we going to go in the future? So if we kind of project ourselves five years into the future, where do you think we'll be in terms of either the amount of DNA that we're going to be collecting from African populations, but also what does that mean in terms of actually pinpointing where uh, people might have come from in Africa? Yeah, so I, yeah, I mean, you know, you saw the, the projects that I that I put up, and, and um, although the you know the efforts in Africa are not comparable to what is happening in Asia or, or what we have available for Europe, and you can you know it's really fascinating. Showed me some some plots earlier for 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 Europe and for for the British Isles, and it is uh, fascinating to see the kind of resolution that we can get. But um, you know, given the the work. That is being done, and you know, at some point we'll, we'll, we will get there as well. Now, the other thing to say in that context, though, it, 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 it's it's the 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 to, to, to in order to do this type of work, yes, you need reference data, but you also need for variation to be present. So, if you've had historical processes, migrations, and so on that led to uh, homogenization of uh, populations. So in, in the context of Africa, you know, people always talk about the Bantu migrations, for instance, um, that have, you know, kind of muddled up the signal, if you want. Then, you know, the idea of trying to uh, have enough resolution in order to pinpoint origins will always be difficult, but that's a caveat. I think the other big thing to remember, of course, is that there's 200 times more genetic diversity in Africa than there is in the rest of, of the world. So it's, in practical terms, if if an African person wants to get as many DNA matches in their list of results from any of the commercial databases, we'd almost have to test 200 times more Africans than we currently have tested Europeans. I mean, I, well, I, I, that's a calculation that I can't follow that quickly, but I mean, I think that uh, it would maybe, the fact that there is more genetic variation in Africa would actually make the exercise easier because you have you have more variation present. Would you get as many matches? Would you get as many matches? Um, I, I, I believe that if you're able to generate data uh, and you have more genetic variation, you, you 
you should be able to do it at higher resolution. The questions for now? So we have uh, Jenny here in the front. Do you think there's any chance of having much more ancient DNA data? There's only a handful of studies so far that have produced ancient DNA. I think it was Ethiopia and Iraq, they were from South, South Africa. But there's so much, there must be so much knowledge in all the DNA samples from Africa, and it's wonderful to have some ancient African DNA. Thank you, Debbie. So that's a very, very interesting question. And, and of course, as you know, as I said earlier, like as the trade of humankind and, and, and our you know common origin and uh, now the, the history of anatomy modern humans going back three hundred thousand years at, at least, it's 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 uh, you know yeah, it, 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 it's a fascinating place to 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 uh, to look at and to work on. And I'm, yeah, I'm very much hoping that, that more will be available. And there are there are things. I mean, just I think last week or a couple of weeks ago, there was a paper by um, colleagues from Uppsala, I think, um, uh, working on uh, ancient DNA from from Sub-Saharan Africa. The challenge, of course, is is preservation. Um, so a lot of areas are are you know are tropical or subtropical, and that leads to a you know, rapid decay of ancient DNA. But having said that, I. To, I worked in the Caribbean, and you know we were also able to 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 uh, recover data that goes back thousands of years. So it's not it's not it's not impossible, and I'm sure that there will be studies coming out. Great. Do we have a question here from Peter? Yes, as a Swede, I has had to ask. Uh, far less people in Denmark are taking genetic genealogy tests than in any way place in Scandinavia. Do you have a theory, theory why and how do you get your things to test more? <laughs> it's like a white spot on the map. That's a very, very personal question there. <laughs> Interesting. I didn't know that, but you know, maybe the Danes are just comfortable with who they are. And they are uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know. It's an interesting, it's an interesting question though. Um, but I didn't, wouldn't, I wouldn't even want to venture guessing why that might be. But it's interesting. Right. Other questions for Hannes? Yeah, we have a question over here. Could I ask you to come over here because that loudspeaker is so close, I'm afraid we're going to get some interference. I read a book about uh, slaves who were taken from Baltimore down in the <coughs> They were sold, Irish slaves, they were sold somewhere in the world. Is there any data on that? Those were Irish, the Irish ship came in and just took, them, took a whole village. This was the, the Barbary pirates that actually uh, came into Baltimore, which is a little village in County Kerry. And as far as I'm, that was a corp, corp, pardon me. And uh, that was a sin. Um, the, but they ended up in, in uh, North Africa rather than in the Caribbean. But they ended up in North Africa. They were they were sold into the slave trade on the North African coast, and two of them survived and made it home. And kind of told the story. Is that anything that you've come across, Hannes, or is that part of your research in any way? Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with 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 that, but um, again, you know, the, the the practice of slavery wasn't um, limited to the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, it's an it's an ancient practice that has been, you know, uh, going on for 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 millennia, really. What what stood out with the with the transatlantic slave trade is the scale. Talking about you know over 12 million people being enslaved um, and, and, and you know transported against the will to to another part of the world. Um, but uh, the, to answer your question, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any of this type of work being done. Um, and I also don't. There are there are books that have been written about it, um, but in terms of you know historical research that you know take, that takes on that scale, I don't. I, uh, in terms of Eurotask, now Eurotask was a project that ran from when was it? It was, about, it was a five year project, but is, is, it, is it still, it's, it's not active at the moment. But what plans might there be for a reactivation or a revisitation in the future? Yeah, I mean, that depends on funding, as so much else does. Um, but uh, I mean, we're, you know, we're happy that. First, these, the, the 13 PhDs all finished their PhDs. Uh, one of them is actually in the, in, in, in the room here. And uh, so, um, and they also carry on working on some of those topics. Um, so that, that work continues. 
and yeah, I mean, there might well be further down the line another grant application and, 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 a, and a new project of that sort. Any final questions for Hannes? Well, it just remains for me to say thank you very, very much for a fascinating uh, talk on a fascinating topic, and uh, thank you for explaining it so well. Ladies and gentlemen, Hannes Schroeder.